Hey y'all, good morning. Um, happy Mother's Day, happy Baby Dedication Sunday. We are so excited to have you here at Vintage Church North. Uh, whether that is here in person at Trinity Academy or you are joining us uh, live streaming online through Facebook Live, however you are with us this morning, we are so glad that you are here today. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jordan Woodard. I'm one of the pastors here at Vintage Church North. Uh, and we here at Vintage Church are a church of doubters, seekers, and followers, and we exist to make much of Jesus. Um, and we do that by being disciples uh, who make disciples who know, live, and advance the gospel. Uh, so what does that mean in real terms? Um, I, I kind of say this week to week when I'm up here, uh, what that means is, is whether you're, you're with us this morning for the first, second, or third time, or you've been worshiping with us for years, uh, this is a place where you can belong. This is a place that you could find and, and that you could call home, a, a place you can bring uh, your doubts, a place you can bring your questions, um, a place that you can bring the, the really messy, heavy parts of life, um, a place that, uh, that there are people here who are, are willing to walk through you through those heavy, heavy, messy things. Um, we would like to invite you, if, if you are new with us, if this is your first or second week, uh, to do what we call sticking six. Uh, and, and what that means is give us six weeks so six weeks is from this Sunday, including this Sunday, through June 12th. Uh, and give us six weeks for you to get to know us, for us to get to know you, for, for you to get plugged into life here at Vintage Church North. Uh, maybe try out a community group or two. Uh, join us for Wednesday morning coffee at uh, Solid Coffee where we gather together and we read scripture and pray together. Um, find a way to, to get plugged in here. A, a great first step in that is when you came in at the, the table right where you came in, we, we have these little cards that are, are blue and white. And we, what we call these are connect cards. Uh, and a, a great first step is fill out one of these connect cards. Give us a little bit of information about you uh, so we can in turn send you a little bit of information about who we are uh, and let you know how you can get plugged in to life here at Vintage Church North. Uh, this morning, go ahead and stand with me if you are able for our call to worship. And our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 96, verses 8 through 10, and it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples 
with equity. Let's worship together this morning. Because 
Each Sunday morning when we come to worship God, uh, when we come together and gather, we, we hope, uh, we really long and desire that you see a small glimpse of who God is. Uh, throughout the Bible, we see a clear pattern of what happens when people experience uh, the holy and all-powerful God. Uh, there's an immediate realization of, of just how different we are from Him, how far we have fallen short from His glory, from His holiness. And there's a realization of our weakness and frailty before the king of the entire universe. So each week during this time, as we worship together and we're made aware once again of our brokenness and the sin in our lives, we take some time and we confess how we have fallen short. We ask God to forgive us in this time. We ask him to renew our hearts. And we ask him to make our hearts more like his. So over these next few moments, take some time, uh, take some time in this quiet to confess your sin, to confess the broken places of your life to our loving Father. Father, we, we come before you this morning Lord, with the sin that we have seen in ourselves, uh, with just a portion of the, the vast library of, of transgressions and wrongs we have actually committed against you. Um, if you, Lord, if you would mark our iniquities, if you would tally up the number of things we've preferred and worshipped above you, Lord, if you would count the number of prideful thoughts. Lord, or count the number of lustful thoughts or bitter thoughts or envious thoughts that have accumulated in our hearts. If you would open the record, Lord, and judge us for every empty or idle word we've spoken. Lord, who could stand? Not one of us here, Lord. Lord, I could not stand before you. But with you, Father, there is forgiveness. Through faith in Jesus Christ, who was pierced for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities, and by whose wounds we are healed. It is in his name we pray and ask for forgiveness this morning, Lord. Amen. So I've said this before, and I have to admit um, that often my heart thinks of our Heavenly Father um, forgiving us as maybe being a begrudging forgiver. Um, that each week as we, we come again before him in our time of confession and repentance and forgiveness, that um, maybe this is some kind of joyless chore uh, that he takes on. But, but scripture paints a really vastly different image of God's forgiveness for us. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, uh, Jesus tells a parable about a, a lost son, one who has wished that his father was dead and then squandered everything he took from his inheritance. And once he realized that he had lost absolutely everything, the son remembers that even his father's servants have it better than he does now. So he gets up and he sets off for home. He's determined that he'll, he'll ask to be a servant in his father's house. And I love the way that uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible tells this story. And I, I've read it before. And um, we give these out often when we do baby dedications. Um, and we, we, we enjoy this book and we love this book and the way it tells stories because they, they speak to little hearts, but they also speak to big kid hearts. Um, so let me read how this story concludes um, from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And it says, as he, the son, starts for home, 
So he begins to worry. Dad won't love me anymore. I've been too bad. He won't want me for his son anymore. So he practices his I am so sorry speech. But all this time, what he doesn't know is that day after day, his dad has been standing on his porch, straining his eyes, looking into the distance, waiting for his son to come home. He just can't stop loving him. He longs for the sound of his boy's voice. He can't be happy until he gets him back. The sun is still a long way off, but his dad sees him coming. What will the dad do? Fold his arms and frown? Shout, that'll teach you. And just you wait, young man. No, that's not how this story goes. The dad leaps off the porch, races down the hill, through the gap in the hedge, up the road, before his son can even begin his I'm so sorry speech. His dad runs to him throws his arm around him, and can't stop kissing him. Vintage Church North, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are freely and joyfully forgiven this morning. And when I say joyfully, I mean joyfully. The Father rejoices over you this morning. Let's take a moment and greet one another in that joy today. We'll probably have to do it a couple times just to get people to come and sit down. There's like indentations in my fingers and stuff. It's really bad. I can't do it. Guys, can you just come and be with us? Also, guys, can you just like sit with us? Just for now? Why don't you guys sit quietly for a bit? Let us continue worshiping.
it's another caught up in words tangled in lies you are a savior and you take brokenness aside and make it Please be seated. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to you. I'm going to give these to Jordan. Uh, I think this year, Christmas was warmer than Mother's Day. <laughs> True or false? Uh, happy Mother's Day to you, uh, and we're doing baby dedications on Mother's Day as we traditionally do, so I'm going to ask the Draper family to join us on stage, and also the McKenna family, and they are going to bring with them Carson and Elliot, respectively. So come on up, guys. Uh, as they're coming up, I want to I wanna read for you one passage, and we, we often read this passage during baby dedication because, uh, because this, passion, this passage is a picture of why we do what we do. It's a picture of why we have families come up here and we dedicate their, their babies to the Lord. Um, Peter has just preached the first sermon in the beginning of Acts. The Holy Spirit has ascended. He's moving in power amongst the people and, and here's what, what Peter says. He says, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And so this promise that, that Peter just shared with the people, this promise of the resurrected Jesus who gives us life as we have faith in him, who does all those things we just, who we just sang about, who takes that, that brokenness and, and, and makes it beautiful because he is our redeemer. All of these promises, uh, salvation through Jesus, these promises Peter said 2,000 years ago are, are for you, are for your children, are for all who are far off. So this promise of the gospel, this promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, through faith in him, is a promise for you, Elliot, and is a promise for you, Carson. And so, and so we stand firm as, as, as families, as pastors, and as a church, we stand firm uh, on this promise, that this promise is, is for you. And so as we do, uh, as we, we dedicate babies to the Lord, uh, what, we, do, we do a couple things. One of the things we do is, is we have uh, parents uh, make a commitment. But because we believe very strongly that, that we as a church are called to worship in community, uh, the charge is also for you, church, as you have a role in the spiritual development of these children. And so the charge for parents, which I failed to introduce everybody. Of course, this is Elliot. Uh, this is Nolan and Lainey McKenna. You've obviously seen them here this morning. You've seen them serving in many ways in our church. Uh, this is James and Leanne Draper and James and Carson, who have been members for a long time. Uh, a long time? How long have you been members of the church? Longer than me. Yeah. Yeah. Longer than me. Uh, <laughs> So McKenna's not longer than me, but we're, we're glad that you guys are here. So parents, 
Uh, as you bring your children here this morning to dedicate them to God, uh, God has entrusted us as parents with important responsibilities. Not just scooting the applesauce to the top of the squeezy thing, but <laughs> parents, you are to bring your child to, to Sunday worship, to live uh, with your child among God's people in community, to faithfully teach the Bible to your children, explaining who God is, who your child is, and what God has done for him and for her in Jesus Christ. To nurture your child in the gospel, to pray for your child, so that in all these things your child may learn to trust in Jesus Christ, proclaim him, care for others, and work for justice and peace. Parents, do you promise to, with God's help, fulfill these responsibilities in order that your children may know the gospel, live the gospel, and advance the gospel in this world? If so, please answer with, we do. Amen. And church, uh, would you stand as we also commit together? Vintage Church, do you promise to support these families, to pray for them, to do all you can to aid in their Christian growth, to come alongside these parents as we raise young disciples who know, live, and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, we do. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we, have some, we have some gifts that we give uh, to, to families. Uh, Melissa Woodard has made a, a beautiful uh, framed piece to commemorate this morning. Also, uh, we always give families a Jesus Storybook Bible as Jordan just uh, read such a beautiful passage from because we want our children uh, to fall in love with God's word and parents as we bring our kids along in the word. We also read uh, over, each child, over each child a blessing. It's a blessing from Numbers. And so I'm going to read this, uh, read this blessing over each child. Elliot, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And Carson, with all those beautiful gifts in that bag, <laughs> Carson, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, even as you have that beautiful smile on your countenance this morning, and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in praying for these families? Lord, thank you for, uh, for the beauty of, of this moment. Thank you, Lord, for the McKennas and the Drapers and their faithfulness uh, to you, their faithfulness to your church. Lord, I pray for Elliot. Uh, I pray for Carson. Lord, that you would, through your word, that you would, through your church, that you would, through the, the miraculous movement of your Holy Spirit, that you would draw them to yourself, that you would show them the love and the grace that you have for them, Lord, that they would fall in love with Jesus, that they would fall in love with your word, that they would fall in love with your church, uh, and Lord, uh, would you use us as your church, would you use James and Leanne and Nola uh, and Nolan and Laney uh, to make disciples who know, live, and advance the gospel. Lord, we, we, we trust these uh, precious children to you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys. If you would at this time, would you stand again as we read God's word together? Today's scripture is Revelation 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, 
and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For the one, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And children, kindergarten through fifth grade, are dismissed to the atrium for kids' church. I tell you, man, Jesus is coming back. If, if those geese, whew, you, you don't know my story with geese, I'll tell you what. I'm all rattled right now. I don't know if I'm able to do this. Whew, deep breath. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. It's on Facebook every year. My brother-in-law posts it. I almost lost my life at the hands of a goose. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. Where are we? Good morning. Good morning. Jesus, give me, give me the composure. All right. Good morning. Uh, welcome again. Uh, if I've not met you, my name is Jared Trumbo. I'm one of the pastors here at Vintage Church. We're in Revelation 2 today, as Kristen just read for us. And uh, this is week two in a, in a three-month series on Revelation. Uh, I, I, we talked about it last week. I'm going to talk about it again. Uh, I'm really excited about spending some time personally in Revelation. I'm excited about, uh, about walking through Revelation with, with you as a church, uh, with our community group. And uh, don't be intimidated. Don't be scared. Uh, don't be... Uh, don't, don't, let's not look at Revelation as, okay, uh, what, what, what is the pastor going to say? What is Vintage Church going to say about Revelation that's gonna, that I'm going to disagree with? Or what are they going to say that I'm going to say, oh, that's a leap? Or, um, or how's, how's the church going to leverage le Revelation to say what they really want to say about politics or about current events or about past history or about the future? But let us look at Revelation, hopefully, and I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again. I want us to look at Revelation, and my hope and my prayer for these next three months as we look at this, this beautiful, mysterious, mind-boggling book of the Bible is that we would say, as John said in the, I think, second to last verse of Revelation, amen, come Lord Jesus. This is, this is a letter that John wrote as Jesus revealed it to him to seven churches. And today, uh, we're going to look at the first of those seven churches to whom John wrote. So would you pray with me? And then we'll jump right in. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to come together as, as your family, as your church, and to, to sit at your feet and to hear from you, Holy Spirit, would you take this word, uh, would you apply it to our lives? Would you give us the strength to live it out? And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So jumping right into verse 1, uh, it says, 
To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So already, when we're looking at chapter two here, we have to rewind back to chapter one. What are we talking about? Uh, Seven stars, seven golden lampstands. Who is he who walks among these lampstands and holds these stars? So we skipped this part of chapter one last week. This is the second half of of chapter one. John begins to share with us, the reader, um, this vision that, that Jesus has given him. Now, you might notice this in your Bible, you might not. It's certainly true in my Bible that these words and the words of the next couple chapters are in red, which means these are the the words of Jesus. And so uh, when we look back at at chapter 1, we see this said about Jesus in 117. It says, Fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. John sees this vision of Jesus, the one who was alive, the living one who died and is alive forevermore. And he's got this, he's got this white hair and he's got these flaming eyes and he's got this sword coming out of his mouth. And it's this, it's this vision and it's this symbolic vision of of who Jesus is. And it says that Jesus is standing as John sees this vision, amongst seven lampstands, and he's holding in his hand seven stars. Now, I wish this were true of the rest of the book of Revelation, but John does it once and only once when he says at the end of chapter one, uh, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you, John, for telling us what the lampstands are and what the stars are. How come you don't do it again for the rest of the book? (laughs) Why don't you just tell us, oh, and that beast, and oh, the dragon, and the seals, and the bulls, and the trumpets? He doesn't do that. But he does it here to talk about Jesus standing amongst these seven lampstands, which are the seven churches to whom John is writing. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus was a church that was in uh, Asia Minor, modern-day western Turkey. Uh, And and so we we know a bit, if we we read the New Testament, we know a bit about this city called Ephesus. And we know a bit also about this specific church in this specific city in, in Ephesus. It was a church that was planted by Paul. We read this story in the book of Acts. It was a church that was planted by Paul uh, about 40 years earlier. In about AD 50-something, Paul in his missionary journeys ends up in Ephesus. We see some stories where uh, Paul's making disciples. And he starts in the synagogue, as he often does, and he's sharing about Jesus with, with the Jewish population. And, and they're interested for a while, and then, they, and then they don't want anything more to do with him. And he goes, and he, he spends actually over two years in Ephesus. When we read Acts, we think Paul's jumping from place to place to place, but he spends two years in Ephesus. And there's this, play, there's this time where uh, those who make silver, silver idols uh, that, that are used in the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, they, their business is being affected. So they get mad about it. And they... Uh, they, they want to drive the Christians out because it's affecting their livelihood. Paul plants this church and goes on. Uh, a few years later, he writes a letter to this church in our New Testament. That letter is called Ephesians. And in Ephesians, uh, Paul writes this letter that gives us a bit of an insight into this church. And, and, and in it, Paul gives some, some instruction, but he also talks about, about the beauty of Jesus. Here's some of the things Paul says in his first letter to the Ephesians, which was probably, I don't know, three decades or so before Revelation was written in the early years of the church. Paul's prayer for this church in Ephesus was that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth 
and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul's command to this, to this church in Ephesus was in, in chapter 5, verse 2, to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. He also gives them some practical advice. Also, he says, uh, but sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. So, 30 years later, when, when Revelation is written, as Jesus has these words through John to this church in Ephesus, how are they doing? How's it been going for the last 30 years? And Jesus gives us here an update. Verse 2 of Revelation 2, it says, uh, Jesus talking to the church in Ephesus says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So in the Roman context, this city of Ephesus in Asia Minor, uh, all of these things that Jesus just commended them for would have been difficult. Uh, the, it, Jesus is commending them. You're vigilant in protecting doctrine, in protecting the truth of the gospel, protecting the church, and being uh, set apart. I said last work that... that Last week, that, that, that even that word, that Greek word, ekklesia, which, which means church, uh, literally means ones who are, who are called out. And, and Revelation is all about the church being called out from the world, being set apart from the world. And what, Paul, or what Jesus is saying to this church in Ephesus, you're doing a really good job of being called out, of being set apart. They have good pastors. They have good shepherds. Those in the church of Ephesus with the gift of discernment are doing a good job of using their gift and calling truth, truth, and false, false. They are enduring patiently and bearing up. This was a difficult task in this Roman context because, because persecution abounded. We even know that John himself was exiled on, on Patmos because of his testimony about Jesus Christ. Uh, th this church would have, would have avoided the cultural temptation of emperor worship, which was a part of Roman culture. Even a few weeks ago, we saw even written on Roman coins about the divinity of the emperor. They've avoided temples and guilds. They don't participate in the worship of Artemis, which was very much... Uh, central to, to life in Ephesus. They don't use that false god as their commerce. In verse 6, so, so, so Jesus kind of does the compliment sandwich thing, you know, like say something good about him and then tell him what's bad and then say something good about him. At the, at the, the bottom bun of that sandwich, uh, he says, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus is commending them for hating the work of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a heretical sect. They were concerned with the body and, and, and not with the spirit. Uh, here's, what, here's what Vincent's words said he says about the Nicolaitans. Um, they taught that in order to master sensuality, one, one must know the whole range of it by experience, and that he should therefore abandon himself without reserve to the lusts of the body. So this church in Ephesus is avoiding the sexually immoral practices of the day, which were rampant. Uh, they're, they're probably vigilant in avoiding purchasing meat and other foods that are part of the practice of idol worship and idol sacrifice. And none of these things would have been easy in the first century in Ephesus in the Roman Empire because commerce, social life, employment, food, it was everywhere. But, they're, but they're, 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 they're remaining true, they're enduring patiently, they're bearing up, they're doing it well, 
with endurance, and Jesus himself is commending them for it. In our context, it probably would be a, a very similar commendation that Jesus could give to, to a church or to a believer that was, that was in this boat. Um, you're avoiding the practice of and, and consuming media that promotes the new sexual revolution, and hopefully you're doing a diligent and wise job of teaching your children to do the same. You're not falling into the trap of putting your ultimate hope or even your worship into politics and government. You abstain from worshiping economics. You have not, as is too normal in our culture, glorified alcohol as your rest, your joy, your deliverer, your peace, and your comfort. You're not allowing culture to determine what is true. This is good. Keep doing this. You are testing, discerning, you are enduring, and bearing up for Jesus' name. Well done. But then Jesus puts a but in there in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This church is good at truth, but is losing its affection. They're really comfortable in, in their own created Christian subculture, which is countercultural. Truth and obedience are easy for them, and they're good at it. But they've abandoned their first love. I think at this point, uh, we sort of have to draw this comparison or this analogy to a marriage. Because uh, marriage can often look like this. Uh, we're married. We file our taxes jointly. We live together. We sleep in the same bed. We buy each other birthday and anniversary presents. We go on vacation together occasionally. Uh, we wear our wedding rings, and everybody knows where we stand. And, and we're faithful to each other uh, really because it would just be too messy to not be. Kids, attorneys, property. Intimacy is something we used to have and do and really enjoy. And maybe uh, one is, is thankful for all the other does. He takes care of me well. Uh, I couldn't imagine living without her, maybe because he can't cook, is disorganized, doesn't know the kid's homework schedule. It's just, it's just easier to keep doing this thing than it would be to not anymore. But every once in a while, you see a wedding picture that shows up maybe on a slideshow or on your computer background, and, and you think about how different it was then than now. Maybe even how magical it was then. And that, that picture of, of a marriage gone stale is, is sort of the picture of, of what Jesus is saying to this church in Ephesus. They're doing all the right things, and they're, and they're staying faithful, and they're, and they're holding firm to the right beliefs and actions, but they've abandoned their first love. And, and Paul's, or Jesus' words for this church is to repent. He says, it, uh, he says it twice. Repent and do the works you did at first. Repentance, uh, this, this word of repentance is not just, does not just mean to, to feel sorry. It doesn't just mean to, to feel guilty. Uh, we, we've talked about this many times before. Uh, we've talked about sort of the, the process of repentance. And we usually share it in a three-part process, if we can call it a process. That sounds too, too, too stale, too stiff. Repentance starts with conviction. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the job of God's Word. That's maybe even the job of our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we, when we realize and we know uh, what, I've, what I've done, what I am doing is wrong. 
is not right, is, is sin. We're convicted. Hopefully, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a right spiritual context, conviction then leads to confession. We believe that, that confession, biblically speaking, is something that absolutely we do with our Heavenly Father, but it's also something that we do horizontally as well. There are often times where we have to confess to the Lord because we've offended Him. We also have to confess to our brother or sister because we've offended them. Or even if I've not offended my brother or sister, I've sinned against the Lord and I need uh, a brother or sister to help me in this process. Conviction, confession, repentance is the change of mind and the change of action. Because if we stop at conviction, the only thing we're going to get is guilt. If you're convicted and that's the end of it, now you feel guilty, now you feel bad. If conviction leads to confession and we've shared that with the Lord and we've shared that with others, if we stop there, that leads to pride. Because I've done what I'm supposed to do, great, I'm good now. But repentance is the final step in the process where it leads to a change of, a change of mind a change of thinking, a change of affection, but also a change in action. A change in mind or heart. Remember the affection you once had and return to it is the call for the church in Ephesus. But also a change in action. Repent and do the works you did at first. There's a, uh, the way that I, maybe you've caught on to this, I don't know. The way that I usually structure my sermons is I do some sort of an introduction and review, and then we exposit the text, and then I apply. Whenever I start with a blank document, I put, I put, I put intro, uh, exposit, apply. It's just, it's really simple. And when I got to the apply section of this passage, my thought was, how do we apply this? How do you tell someone that is sitting here that is potentially uh, in the same place as the church of Ephesus where maybe you've been a, a follower of Jesus for a long time and maybe that has grown stale, grown stale and maybe Jesus would say to you, you, you've abandoned your first love. What do you say to that person about how do you apply this and how do you, how do you fix it? And I... And I at first, I, my thought was, how do you tell someone to love something more? I don't know that we can do that. Like, just love it more. I don't know that it works like that. But I think there are two things. Well, it's actually one thing with two different applications. That is what we are called to do as believers. I think could apply to the husband and wife scenario as well. But it's, it's what we're called to, and this is how we maintain increase our affection. And I think it's all about presence. Not P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. It's all about presence. We need, to, we need to be present with Jesus through his spirit, through his word, and we need to be present with those who love Jesus. Just very simple. How do we fix it? We fix it with presence with Jesus. We're told, uh, Paul tells us in, in First, First Thessalonians, to pray without ceasing. And I think one of the things that means is always having the gospel in the front of our mind. To be present with Jesus, to be, to be living in the spirit, to be constantly in conversation and communion with the spirit and with Jesus through that spirit is, is to have the gospel in the front of our minds. Here's an example. Uh, maybe you just got a poor job performance at work. Feeling like an inadequate parent because of the morning routine. Maybe you just got a bad report card. To have the gospel in the front of my mind is to know uh, that, that while we were still sinners, 
While in my shortcomings, in my bad grades, in my inadequacies, it was in that place that Christ died for me. Gospel in the front of my mind. That'll change your affections in that moment. Or the example, maybe you're experiencing uh, loneliness. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's anxiety, anger, fear. Jesus Christ is victorious. That's the beauty of Revelation. Not will be victorious. Jesus Christ is victorious. Here's what we learned last week. He has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom past completed action with continuing results and effects. And I don't in any way say that to downplay the reality of mental health struggles. Because even when you are not victorious over anxiety, depression, fear, loneliness, anger, even when you are not victorious, Christ is victorious. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you are in Christ. Or maybe the example is cancer, divorce, Alzheimer's, abuse. The gospel in the front of your mind is the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. These are Jesus' words for the worst case scenario. How do we fix it? To be present with Jesus. To be praying without ceasing. To have the gospel in the front of our minds. To be present in his word. One of my goals each Sunday. It's a, I don't know, maybe it's a secondary goal. But one of my goals each Sunday is that you would leave here more in love with and having a deeper hunger for God's word than when you came in. We, we give away scripture journals and Matthew kaleidoscope books for our kids and Jesus storybook Bibles for baby dedications and we have equipped classes and we do all these things because Jesus is present in his word. And because if, if the affection uh, for Jesus is, is lacking or has been abandoned, one of the ways we return to that is presence with Jesus through his spirit and through his word. Another way to increase or to maintain or to regain affection is to be present with people who love Jesus. Because there's a principle in life, and this doesn't just apply spiritually, this applies across the board. Uh, has there ever been a time in your life where you've been with somebody or you've experienced something with somebody and that other person really, really loves something and you find yourself drawn to that affection. I was at a party, a, a rager. It was a really cool party. And, uh, and Crystal Penton was there. I asked Crystal permission to share this. And at the party, we had to give a monologue. We had to, uh, we had to wax poetic or logical about something that, just something, anything. Everything from... Uh, mustaches to whatever was covered. But Crystal got up and shared about quilting. I learned how to use a sewing machine at home economics in seventh grade, but I wouldn't say in any way I'm, I'm a passionate sewer. But as Crystal shared about the history of quilting and shared about the storytelling in quilting and shared about all the different ways in which it is done, because she has a love for it, I found myself sitting there like, this is riveting. This is fascinating. And I care nothing about quilting. <laughs> but I'm, I'm watching and listening to someone who's incredibly passionate about quilting share this. And, my, and my, I found myself thinking, this is amazing. And I'm not a quilter. Another example. 
This, uh, this last week, just finished Friday, my, my stupid brother uh, ran in a 250-mile race. Yes, you heard that right. He ran in a 250-mile race in northern Arizona. And it was on a live feed, and there was one website you could track the runners. They had like a tracking thing on them, and you could track where they were. And he was bib number 11, and I was tracking him for five days. And uh, there was a YouTube where, where they, for the first two days, they did it all day. And for the last three days, they did it all day and all night. There were commentators, and there were cameras all over the course, and there were people following. And, and I found myself sucked into this world. As I told you last week, I'm not a runner. And, uh, but I found myself um, obsessed. Now, part of it was because my brother was there. Part of it was because I was praying for him for five days straight, almost praying without ceasing for this guy. And there, there's aid stations all along the course, and there's, uh, there's people that give up a week of their lives to come and, and man an aid station. And they're like cooking when you do this, you, ate, you eat junk food the whole time because your body needs like just something to burn. So they're like pounding Mountain Dews and they're eating just junk. And uh, one station, there's like lasagna and one station, they're like cooking steak and you just have to keep up the calories. And then there's other people, uh, they call, they're called pacers. So my brother had a friend that came with him to pace him. So it's a friend who's not in the race who will run alongside you for a long time and then he'll go sleep. And then he'll catch up with you 10 hours later and he'll run alongside you as an encourager. And then there's guys that, that are there like flying their drones to, to do the cameras. And there's guys that are there with like a follow cam and they'll run behind you with a camera so that I can sit in my very comfortable couch <laughs> with, the, with the drink in hand and watch these guys run for 250 miles. And he, and he, and he finished on Friday just slightly over 101 hours. And here was the thing, I found myself being consumed with this thing because these pacers and these aid station workers and these commentators, they were passionate about running. The race was in Northern Arizona, they are passionate about Northern Arizona. They're passionate about endurance races, ultra marathons. And I found myself, number one, wishing I was there. I wish I was there at an aid station. I wish I was there to help my brother's wife to do all the, the crew stuff. And there was a moment, a like really, really, really small moment, where I even thought to myself, man, I'd like to try that sometime. <laughs> but that's how, that's how consumed I was with being surrounded by all these people that were passionate about something and loved it and were giving their lives to it. And my thought was, I'd like to go run 250 miles. And then I talked to my brother after the race, and I never will think that ever again <laughs> as he shared with me how it was. Be present, and not just present observing from the distance, but be present with people who love Jesus. And that's a two-sided coin. Because be the guy or the gal who other people want to be present with you because of your love for Jesus. That's community group. That's Sunday morning worship. That's life. Be present with people who love Jesus. And be the person who loves Jesus that others want to be present with. I love Jesus. I'd love to, to get together with you and see how I can pray for you and encourage you in maybe some of the struggles in life that I mentioned earlier. My schedule is pretty open. Coffee, lunch, come by the office. But here's how, here's how this closes. In verse 7, here's Jesus final words to the church in Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That might initially sound like a really lofty challenge and a really high bar, and it is. 
But here's the beauty of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the conqueror. And when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I have conquered through Jesus. Because, because, Jesus, because Jesus came down, the, the, the incarnation, sometimes uh, theologians say, because Jesus condescended and became a man so that he could show us the way, so that he could live the perfect sinless life, so that he could die on the cross for us, so that he could conquer death and sin, so that he could be resurrected, saying not just with his words, but with his resurrected body and life, I am the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet he will live. As a follower of Jesus, I've conquered because Jesus conquered. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You're going to see at the end of uh, at the end of all seven of these letters that Jesus has that same pattern at the end to the one who conquers. And you're also going to see uh, the results of what he says to the ones who conquered. If we flip to the last page of the book of, of the book of Revelation chapter 21 and 22, what we see is all of these things fulfilled, including eating of the tree of life. We see him fulfilled in Revelation 21 and 22 as Jesus ultimately and finally conquers. So maybe you're thinking, yeah, that Ephesus, that word is also for me. And yeah, Jared, I get what you're saying about, yeah, I need to be better at practicing the presence of, of God and, and being involved with those who love Jesus. I get the presence thing. But the word to you is, Jesus has conquered. And if we have faith and trust in him, we are also victorious. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, we love because you first loved us. And Jesus, we... Uh, we know that our, our love for you is, uh, is imperfect and our love for you um, comes and goes, but Lord, we stand firm in uh, the steadfastness of your love for us this, this morning. Even as the, the story Jordan read earlier uh, of the father who ran out and couldn't stop kissing his son, Lord, we, we, we bask in the steadfastness of your love for us this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you move in our hearts and would you uh, increase our affections for Jesus? Or would you use your word? Uh, would you use this church to increase uh, our affection for Jesus? Lord, we want to stand firm on all those things that that church at Ephesus stood firm on. But Lord, would you, uh, would you cause us to fall in love with you more every day? Ultimately, we, we stand firm on the victory that is ours through Jesus Christ, who conquered sin, who conquered death. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Each week we respond. Uh, we respond by taking communion. And we do that every week here at Vintage Church. We would invite you, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, to join us in, in this meal. And this meal, though, I don't think the disciples knew it at the time. This meal is a, is, a, is, a, is a conquering meal. It's a meal of victory. When Jesus took that bread the night before he was crucified and he broke it and he gave it to his, to his disciples, he said, this bread represents my body, which is given for you. And when he took that cup and he poured it and he, and he gave it to his disciples, 
And he said, uh, this cup represents my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This blood of the new covenant, it's, it's blood of, of victory and of conquering. And ultimately, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that, that victory was, was finished. And so if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus and if you join us in communion this morning, may we as a church commune together in the victory of Jesus through his body and his blood, which was given for us. We also respond each week by singing uh, because we, we sing praises to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Singing is a way to, to show one's affection. And we respond uh, by giving. Uh, there's a couple ways you can give. You can give physically, presently, uh, in the box, in the atrium. Or you can give by texting VINTAGE to 77977. That'll take you through the secure process to do that there. We give as a, um, as a reflection of our affection for Jesus. But here's something that I've learned in my own life with obedience. And I think this was probably eventually true of the church in Ephesus. Sometimes uh, we, we obey out of an overflow uh, of our affection. But sometimes uh, the affection is, is, is waning. And we obey because we know that that's how we endure and because that's what we need to do. And oftentimes when obedience goes first, oftentimes our heart follows behind. And so... The church in Ephesus was commended for their, for their obedience, even as their affection was lacking. And so sometimes the obedience comes first and, and then the heart comes through that obedience. Uh, and we would love to pray for you. Uh, there's going to be a couple of us there in the, in the back of the gym um, during these next couple songs, if there's any way that, that we can pray for you. Maybe we can pray uh, that God would stir up in you uh, that, that first love again we would count it a, a, a joy and a privilege to be able to pray for you in that way. So would you stand together and let's respond.
gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should
caught in the curtain over there. Um, Y'all, a few announcements before we head out this morning. Um, on Saturday, May 21st, at the, uh, the bright and early hour of 5.30 in the morning, uh, we are having our men's ministry ruck. Uh, if you are not familiar with what uh, a ruck is, it is an insane thing that we men do where we put weight on our backs and we show up really early and we hike long distances together. Um, but it is a great time to, to gather with our brothers in Christ, uh, to cur encourage one another, uh, to pray for one another, uh, and just have that time where um, we can be around others who love Jesus Christ uh, and walk shoulder to shoulder uh, through difficult things with them, even if that difficult thing is carrying a heavy backpack at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, so if that sounds like something you guys would be excited about, uh, Honeycutt Park on uh, Saturday, May 21st. Uh, come and join us. If you have any questions, uh, catch up with my, with my man, uh, Nolan, over here, and he'll give you the uh, lowdown on uh, what we're doing. Um, hopefully that early morning you will work up a good appetite because that following Sunday we're having a new member's lunch uh, right after service. So that's a great time. Uh, don't plan on going anywhere right after church service is over with. Stick around here. We're going to eat together to welcome new members and, and also just be around one another and uh, enjoy that time. And then a, uh, another announcement that came in this morning is a save the date for Vintage Kids Day Camp. Uh, go ahead and put it on your calendars. That's going to be July 14th and 15th, and there'll be more information coming to you on that soon. And uh, you may have noticed when you came in some beautiful flowers in our entranceway. Uh, please do, if you are a mom, and not just moms, if you're if you're a grandmother, um, if you are an aunt, if you're a caretaker, if you are someone uh, who, who takes part in, in the loving and, and, and taking care of, of a kid, um, please feel free to grab one of those on the way out this morning as our gift and as part of our celebration of you today. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times community groups. Uh, if you would like to check out and try a community group, I think uh, Chris said we have a slide on how you can uh, reach out, touch the base with Jessica Huey, and she'll help get you plugged in. All right, our benediction this morning is actually a verse you already have heard, and it comes from, oops, if I can get my phone to work right, comes from number six, and it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Vintage Church North, go in peace this morning. Yours is the key.